Um, the next panel we're going to have is uh, in cooperation with the San Francisco Music Tech Summit. And um, it's about the international music startup scene. We have a couple of um, experts here on stage um, from the different music tech uh, hubs, um, like in San Francisco, of course, uh, London, Tel Aviv, and uh, Scandinavia. So, um, and the panel will be hosted um, by Andrea. Andrea is the founder and host of the Digital Music Trends. And I will pass on my microphone to you, Andrea. Um, yeah, and have fun. Thank you very much. And thanks for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session. It's such a nice, sunny Friday afternoon that uh, we're worried about attendance, but it's, it's going well so far. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to the International Music Startups Hubs what comes with the boom uh, session. So today we're going to have a conversation around startup hubs and I'm hoping to tackle a few different areas really, uh, well, looking at uh, definition, location, practical issues, uh, uh, downsides of the boom as well and, and of the hype. Uh, and first of all, we should start with an introduction of uh, our fantastic panel here today. Uh, and uh, I've asked the panelists actually to prepare a very short introduction uh, of what they do and where they're based as well. Uh, and we'll have a lot more room to talk about their company uh, later on in the session. So uh, Anna, do you want to start from, from your end? Hi, I'm, I'm Anna. I'm here from Zoo Labs. Uh, we're located in Oakland, California. Uh, we are, we call ourselves a music accelerator. We uh, help music making teams uh, launch uh, their, their projects and we help them cross the entrepreneurial threshold. So we have designed a music residency program that gives them workshops and mentorship uh, to build a strategic plan as well as time and space in the recording studio to make new artwork. Perfect, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Tobias. Um, I have kind of a nasty cold, so please bear with my voice. Uh, I'm from Native Instruments, and those of you who make music probably know Native Instruments because we create software for DJing and for music production. We have been founded in Berlin 18 years ago, and as of today, we are probably one of the biggest technology companies here with around 400 employees. And I think that's the perspective that we are contributing here today, that we are kind of like a startup of a prior generation. That's grown up, right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jörn. I'm here with uh, Soundrop, and Soundrop is one of the emerging startups to come from Oslo. We started there in 2011, and um, we're here today uh, to, uh, well, in this festival to talk about uh, Shoda.co, our new product. And many of you know us from Soundrop, uh, the app that launched with Spotify in 2011 as well. Great. Hi, I'm Gilly uh, from NovaWind. We are based in Tel Aviv and Zurich, and we do outsource of biz dev uh, and marketing, basically helping startups from the go-to-market stage and beyond. Hi there, my name's Yuli. Uh, I run a small company called Reactify. We're based in London. Um, and we focus on interactive music and reactive and generative music via sound installations and iPhone apps. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the introductions. And I think one of the first things that I really picked up on when I, when I looked at the lineup of, of the panelists as well was the fact that when we look at music tech startups, we're not you know, looking at a homogeneous picture of you know, companies that are doing similar things or even in similar spaces. But here we have a, a very wide spectrum of people doing different things. And so the first thing that came to my mind was talking about definition. And so how do you define a music tech hub and you know, what do you think makes a music tech hub uh, today? And uh, is there even such a thing, you know, uh, as a music tech hub? Uh, for me, I think what defines it is just having a really broad mix of people available for you to meet and network with and and work with. Um, and so, you know, I've well, I've been based in London. Uh, we founded the company in London, and we've been there ever since. Um, I think if we were based in another city, uh, we would have certainly considered moving to London at some point. Um, but because we've started off there, that's where we've stayed. Um, and really, it's got such a diverse culture of musicians and artists and technologies. And that comes from not only the, the culture that's there already, but also like a really thriving university culture, for example. There are a lot of really good music universities, technology universities. Um, and so, I started the company straight after university myself, um, so really that's that's what's been keeping us there 
is that there's always a really interesting mix of people that you can network with. There's mixers, networking events every night of the week. Yeah. Um, and really, f for me and, and for music technology and the kind of stuff that we do, um, there's a short list of three cities that I would consider living in, and it's in order London, Berlin, and San Francisco. Um, I thought you'd put Barcelona in there as well. Uh, no, but well, Barcelona is probably a fourth. Yeah. yeah. Um, but... I am definitely considering coming to Berlin very soon. Um, but for me, like the startup pub, I think, yes, it does exist. And, and I think London is definitely one of them. Yeah. Um, but as I'm sure everyone's going to say, um, there's, there are good, good places to be everywhere. Yeah. It's just a matter of degree and your company and what your company needs. Yeah. Yeah. Gilly, you, you raised an in interesting point in the, in the prep of the session. So what, what's your take on this? Yeah, so I, I'd like to expand beyond uh, dedicated music hub to, to what makes an ecosystem. And there, uh, if, I, if I expand a little, uh, I, I would like to see, uh, of course, uh, a support system for the startups, meaning can I go out at 11 o'clock, meet my peers for a drink, exchange, help each other, are there any corporates there who can provide me with insight, who can... Uh, give me guidance or, or help me with whatever I need help with, SDKs and so on. Um, and of course, uh, is there enough, I, I would say, funding in, in that specific city? So uh, if you go pure music, I'm, I'm in agreement. There are like maybe four worldwide. Uh, but if we go ecosystems, then we start expanding it to, to many more. Uh, example in Israel, we have about 40 startups in, in the domain of music out of 8,000 startups. So, and they're not treated special, they're you know, startups and they get help and, and funding like everyone else. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Jorn, what's, what's your experience in terms of a definition? Of course, you come from, a, from a, a, a Oslo where th there are a few companies that work in this sector, but perhaps not as many as in London or other cities. So how have, have you found your experience in defining yourself as a, as a, st a music startup hub, in a sense? Well, uh, we're a music hub by, by definition because Oslo is the one place where, where you actually have an aggregation of major labels, indies, a vibrant uh, music scene, uh, some funding, and, and you don't have to tick off all of these uh, boxes, but uh, if you have some that at least helps in doing that. I'll add to it that I think Oslo is, is further behind than, than other Nordic uh, capitals. But, um, and, and that has some infrastructural reasons and, and more, which I'm sure we'll get to later, but in terms of def defining yourself as a startup hub, it's, it, it's really a um, combination of, of those factors and how many people you are. Uh, there, there's not that many uh, other places in Norway to really do these things. Yeah, uh, uh, Tobias, uh, in terms of Berlin, uh, obviously you have a slightly different viewpoint, but the interesting thing is that you can also uh, perhaps have a bit of a bird's eye view of what's going on in Berlin as, as far as a music hub uh, from the point of view of the company that's grown up in the city. So how have you seen the scene evolve here and, and how would you define the, the music startup scene here, here in Berlin? I would say going back to why Native Instruments was founded, um, that was in 1996, and at that point in time, I would say Berlin was not, there was no startup scene in Berlin, but there were already conditions that were very favorable for startups because of the low rent, um, cheap office real estate, and the main factor was, of course, the music scene, the electronic music scene, because the notion or the, the premise that an I started out on was to create music software that specifically accommodated electronic dance music techno, so for us. Um, the cultural domain was really what, what made it so suitable for, for Native Instruments. And that has, of course, not changed. It's still the same very diverse uh, cultural environment. And the first startup boom really only came around the year of 2000, if you look back. And uh, at that point in time, Native Instruments became kind of swept up in it. But um, the biggest aspect of it was probably that, that everyone was trying to convince the company to go public. And the fact that Native Instruments never went public is probably the reason that it is still around today, because that was obviously why a lot of uh, companies disappeared. And that first startup boom was also much different than to today, because today it's very much everyone is aware of the value and the perspective of this technology sector. And there is a lot of not just funding, but a lot of efforts from, from the city to really give it, give it a, 
a very favorable framework. And back then it was not like that. It was, it was much more chaotic and much more, I would say, the first startup boom back then was much crazier as well, much unorganized. And now we're not, we not a startup anymore. So a lot of what happens here is mostly relevant for us in that we maybe exchange ideas with the startup scene, but that we also compete with the startup scene, sure. for example, for talent. So we are looking, these days we are looking more onto it from, from a, let's say, from the side. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's going to be interesting to talk about uh, practical matters like hiring as well later on. And uh, Anna, from, from your perspective, uh, what's you know, your definition uh, for San Francisco and why do you think it is a startup hub? Um, why I think, sorry, can you... Why do you think it is a, a startup hub? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah for well, music, so, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, when you talk about the Bay Area, obviously it's a startup hub. I mean, Silicon Valley is, is just there um, in the South Bay. I think uh, there's so much startup activity going on there that there's a ton of resources. There's, um, there are VCs, there are incubators and accelerators giving mentorship. Um, you know, they're like on every corner, it seems like, co-working spaces. Um, so it's a very rich startup culture. I think in terms of music, um, it's interesting because we I've heard from um, some people in the music industry, obviously Los Angeles is a big music hub for music business, but um, a lot of the music business has actually shifted so much to tech that San Francisco has become um, not necessarily startup music tech, but actually big music tech, whether it's, you know, Grace Note or Apple or, you know, Beats Music started there. Um, and so I think you've, you know, a lot of the music industry in terms of the future facing tech has, has shifted to the Bay Area. It's an interesting um, concept. And um, I think one of the other things that, uh, that is interesting to think about is is really how do you um, allow for these companies to grow and thrive and sustain in the long term because that's what we see in in San Francisco as a sure. hub is that they they come and they go so quickly so that's that's one thing that I'll add to the conversation absolutely and uh, I think you know the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the relationship between artists uh, and the tech scene in a sense because uh, uh, you really talk about uh, the fact that in London for example you see a lot of uh, interaction between the two spheres but in San Francisco for example there, uh, there isn't a huge amount of music industry in a sense there are a lot of musicians of course around but uh, there isn't that institutional music industry in the city uh, you have to travel sort of an hour south on the plane to get to LA and do that and so uh, perhaps Anna if you, if you want to if you want to uh, start off with uh, how do you feel that relationship is happening in San Francisco if it's happening at all and uh, what can it can it improve in a sense and then of course uh, we kind of went this way uh, for this question but feel free to jump in and you know I don't want to make this a uh, back and forth panel uh, if you have anything to say just just grab the mic yeah I think one one of the things at zoo labs that we've discovered is that uh, music tech startups specifically really want to get in touch with with artists you know um, it's uh, one of their, you know, major user bases, whether it's actually the artists themselves using it or the fans of the artists using it or whether it's, you know, creating a way for them to interact. So for us at Zoo Labs, being some place that houses musicians, we're a recording studio, we really have found um, that the music tech startups that come to see us are really interested in developing that community and that space because I don't think that exists and it doesn't really exist in, you're not going to find artists in a, a, a tech accelerator. So um, creating those spaces, I think, is really important and something that's not um, really been solved yet in the Bay Area. One thing I'll add also is Silicon Valley is in the South Bay, but we're in Oakland and we're seeing a lot of the startups move from Oakland, I mean, from San Francisco to Oakland because of the, you know, uh, it's lesser rent prices for offices and um, this is. Yeah, Jorn, you were also talking about the, the, the music ecosystem in, in Oslo and sort of the fact that labels are there and, and, and everything. So how do you find, how did you first develop your relationship with musicians and do you feel like startups are reaching out enough to, to artists to, to develop a, a rapport there? Well, I think that many are finding it very difficult to reach this uh, artists because there is a huge gap between uh, some groups of developers and some groups of artists and not a lot of trust, maybe. I think that's remedied by 
uh, more new companies like, uh, we talked about Phonophile earlier, uh, someone that has a more entrepreneurial spirit. They talk to artists on a very indie level and, and have a very large base to talk to. And, and I think that builds trust from a tech community over to an artist community. Uh, other than that, it's, uh, I think it comes uh, from certain musical genres, like the, the best example would probably be Berlin and the electronic music scene and how they embrace new technology simply because it really fits the musical style and it fits their, uh, their audience. So it just, it, it makes a lot of sense. You're talking to people who uh, both are, uh, are a consumer and a, and, a, and a buyer of your product really. And I, th I think that's the bridge uh, more people should perhaps be looking for. Yeah, and and you of course uh, you you've talked you've worked at, uh, on countless uh, hack projects, uh, mm. various music hack days, and you talked about the fact that there is that relationship, but at the same time, it does feel like musicians are still in a sense uh, they feel detached from tech because they've always been open to musicians to join, but we've never seen that much of an uptake on the, on the front. No, exactly. That was the next thing was I wanted to bring up was actually the fact that we talk about specific hubs like London and Oslo and and anywhere really, um, and. If you want to see what kind of music scene you have, just host a music hack day there, and developers will come in droves. Um, and it's always so surprising, well, not surprising anymore, but now it just makes perfect sense. You know, you just need to facilitate these people to work on these pet projects because a lot of developers who uh, have absolutely the right skill set and knowledge to work on these kinds of projects and work with artists and, and, and create this kind of work and get involved in that kind of stuff, um, they just might not be doing it as their day job. And so music hack days are a great way of doing that. And you're right, artists have always been welcome, but the nature of the music hack day kind of scene as it's evolved over the last few years has been more focused on music metadata and not so much music creation. Um, so I'm working with a team of people at the moment to try and found a new kind of music hack day which is much more focused on music creation and creating a much more close relationship between artists who aren't necessarily developers and developers who aren't necessarily artists and getting them working together. And actually, there, there's already been one of these um, events very much like that called MIDI Hack. Um, that was in Stockholm uh, a couple of months ago, and it was a great success because it was a lot more focused on music. I mean, and for London specifically, we're very lucky to have artists based there like um, Imogen Heap and Tim Exile and all sorts of these people who are very uh, tech savvy and they have built up teams of people around them over, over years um, who, who help them realize their visions. Um, and that's particularly what we're really interested in doing. Um, but I think, I think artists can do that anywhere. They just have to have the desire to go out and, yeah. and meet these people. Absolutely. I mean, for London as well, I would add that there's also a, an academic element, which is really interesting because there are universities like Queen Mary that have very extensive programs working a, around the music, digital music spectrum. Yeah, Queen Mary's, Goldsmith's, um, yeah, there, there's a bunch of them and they all foster really amazing talent. You know, lots of people doing amazing projects for undergrad, postgrad. Because um, like even the Imogen yeah. Heap gloves, if anybody's seen the videos of her gloves, uh, some of the team is actually comes from uh, Queen Mary, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And, it's part, and it's also part funded by the Arts Council and part funded by the Roundhouse. And, you know, we're, we are spoiled in London, I've got to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, no, there's, there's no shortage of interaction between artists and developers now, uh, but it can always be more. Um, and really, I think that has to come from the individuals involved, I think, um, because it's, it's just about getting out there and, and networking. And yeah. working on these kinds of projects, you will find people out there who are enthusiastic about them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gilly talking about Tel Aviv. So, how are you seeing the? Is there uh, um, a, a joining of forces between the artistic community and the tech community, uh, or is it still a separate? I, I would say the, the best, the optimal advance uh, uh, example of, of a geek and musician, and it's a very unique. Is a guy I know who was a, he's, he's still a musician. He's also a tech geek, and uh, he needed a better way to produce his own video clips. So he developed a platform that enables the user to choose uh, uh, wh where, how, how the plot should continue during the clip, and uh, which got an, an amazing level of engagement from, from users. And uh, now he, he made a generic platform out of that. Oh, cool. That's, that's a very unique. What I'm trying to say is both worlds keep meeting, but uh, and, and need to join forces, but, but
but these are different tracks. We saw musicians, uh, you know, use technology for marketing yeah. as, a, as a new way to publish, for example, disrupt the, the whole industry, the label industry, and we see them again uh, with all the areas of creating new platforms for music creation, like Waves, which are very old, but now we have things like Compose, Tonara. So Israel is more coming from the tech side. So how do we create music? How do we uh, teach music? Yeah, Joy Sounds, for example. It's a great example, app yeah. that, that listens to you how you play yeah. and, and provides you feedback if you're wrong and, uh, and, and tells you you need to do this or that. Or you can even write sheet music and, and, and whole concerts and everything with, with a simple iPad app. Yeah. So we're more tech-savvy because the people are more, more tech. And uh, again, it's, it's a population of, of 8 million people. So yeah, absolutely. It, it comes uh, with it. Absolutely. And, and uh, as far as uh, Native Instruments concern, is concerned, how do you maintain that? You, of course, you've always had that relationship because that's sort of how you first <laughs> built up the base of the product. So how do you maintain that relationship with the, with the artists that are using your product and sort of make sure that what you're building is, is you know, kind of is still generates that synergy between you and, and, and the creative community? Well, I would say it's relatively easy for us because the really forward-thinking artists mostly come to us because musicians are always interested in the tools that they use and subsequently in the people who create the tools that they use. So especially for artists who are very conscious about sound or who are very meticulous about any aspect of their craft, they want to get in touch with the people who build their tools. Also, of course, to maybe send out some impulses. So there, I think this, this feedback loop in terms of music software design that has always been there. And we, we have always been the company who is kind of like, who has created the forward thinking, experimental, and also crazy or left field stuff. So we really don't need to make any effort yeah. to get in touch with the artists. It's, I think in music technology, there's a very natural synergy between instrument designers and artists. And of course, a lot of artists not only work with us, but not only work for us, but also at the company. So obviously, in the electronic music domain, it has been much harder to make a living recently. And a lot of, a lot of electronic music, music producers, for them, a day job at a company like an I, or yeah. any other music technology company in Berlin, is a great complement to their artist career, whether it's like a small career that they're having or whether they're just building up their career. So we have a lot of people, I think around two thirds of the people that work for us, they make music or DJ on the side. And if you are a producer, it's just very natural to have a day job in sound design or in product design or even in, in tech support. So for us, it's more a matter of like filtering and curating the exchanges that we have with artists. That's awesome. And Anna, I wanted to sort of uh, di diverge from the uh, conversation a little bit and talk about the fact that this panel is called uh, Music uh, Start uh, Startup Hubs, uh, not Music Tech Startup Hubs. So in a sense, uh, I, you know, I wanted to pick up on the point you made earlier and talk about uh, the fact that startups, uh, you know, the, is there any, uh, are there any musicians in the room here? Artists? And, you know, you were talking about the fact that a startup doesn't have to be a tech startup and it can be a band. So that's sort of the approach you have, Azul Apps, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, so we actually approach um, music makers as, as startups and um, the artists as uh, company owners. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that came out of um, a lot of discussions with artists where they were telling us what their challenges were and some of the barriers they were hitting developing their projects. Uh, and in the last 10 years, obviously, technology has disrupted everything. It's also provided a lot of new opportunities for artists to really um, be more independent and um, you know, control the future of, of, of their careers. Um, and so we really have found these interesting intersections. Coming from the Bay Area, there are so many resources thrown at uh, tech startups. A lot of them are basic business you know, uh, tools, and these can be used by artists also. So whether it's, you know, digital marketing or whether it's even things as uh, nuts and bolts as team dynamics and understanding how to collaborate and manage multiple egos 
you know, these are these are real issues that bands in, confront. Um, and so we try in our residency and our workshops and mentorship to really give them some of these tools to carry forward with them. So I think it, it, it is really interesting to think, you know, we, we get obsessed with the tech side of startups, but also as a nonprofit, Zoo Labs has been a startup for the last year. Um, and we've been building so many um, of our business structures from the ground up. And, and that also, it takes a very, um, a certain kind of um, commitment and um, um, cleverness and uh, innovation and uh, so yeah I think I think it's good to broaden the discussion because um, yeah that the the clues about how to do that come from many places not just tech yeah exactly and you you work you work a lot with uh, all sorts of different type of people really in the types of things that you create with your company so does that uh, do you feel like you get more and more, for example, people from management or even artists themselves that come to you and ask for certain hacks or certain things to be created. And if so, do they approach it in a, in a sort of business-like environment, like, as if they were a company purchasing a service, essentially? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's where we are kind of aiming for. You know, we want to be, we want to facilitate the tech in music tech. Um, and we would really, like, our best kind of projects have always been where there's been a lot of creative input from the artist. Sometimes, we work on commercial projects where there's um, like a branding agency acts as a facilitator. They will put us together with an artist and we, we handle the tech side. Um, but in, even in those cases, the fact that myself and my co-founder Ragnar are both musicians um, has always been instrumental. Um, and I think that's part of the strength of our company is that we understand the music side and the tech side. Um, but, you know, I... I've seen many projects where the, the tech element is purely, purely a tech element. Um, but for us, I mean, I think artists, artists approach us directly. We get approached by management companies and via branding agencies. So it comes from all, it comes from all directions, really. Um, but in general, um, it's most exciting when we are working as closely as possible with an artist. Um, because really, yeah, we just want to act as facilitators, really. If, if we get asked, is this possible? Um, I want to do this with my live performance. I want to do this with my visuals. Or, um, or sometimes we'll just enter into a conversation and we might have a look at their live show and suggest some ideas. Um, so it can be a really two-way conversation. Um, and again, going back to the hack day things, we're getting more and more artists turning up and just you know, poking, poking their head around the door and just saying, you know, what's up? So. Absolutely, and I was wondering actually if uh, a native instrument you do a lot of work with artists directly when it comes to maybe helping the synchronization of certain things. I don't know if you do uh, that kind of work, but uh, given the amount of money that goes into producing light shows, for example, for, for artists, is there like any component of that that you get asked about uh, in your products to integrate some ways of synchronizing lights with native instrument product or anything like that? Or, uh, or in any case, how do you find artists are dealing with those kind of challenges when they are trying to figure out how to put on a live show and they want to incorporate some of your products and, 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 and that side of things? Yeah, I mean, that's of course an aspect, especially syncing sound with lighting. Because that's that a tech, there's a lot of tech companies that do that today, so. Yeah, yeah, and that, that is something that always comes up, like protocols, how to control different things via MIDI. I mean, it's a, that's a very technical aspect, but it's definitely, for some artists, it's crucial. And they talk to us about it, and very often it's also a matter of uh, where we need to talk to another company, because, for example, like a, a, a visual software like Module 8, like how can we work with them to make it sync better with Tractor or something. So yeah, that is definitely that is definitely something that is that is relevant for sure. And I think yeah. we have we have always also made an effort when it comes to protocols. For example, if you know OSC, that's a, a special, very flexible protocol that is being used a lot in live situations where it's a lot about connecting different aspects of your setup and syncing it. Absolutely. But you know of course you're saying there was a technical side of the, of the of the product, but of course any artist that has been Touring knows how crucial you know that kind of thing is, and given that live is becoming such a big component of uh, artists' incomes, then it all kind of feeds feeds back into into the the pool of uh, trying to help musicians in, in what they're trying to achieve. And so, uh, I guess like the next question was going to be about uh, funding. So uh, perhaps uh, Gilly, you can give us a bit of an overview of what's going on in Tel Aviv uh, on the funding side of things. Uh, is there money for music? for music tech uh, specifically, and are people just open to good ideas, uh, whatever, the, whatever the field? 
Okay, so uh, in Israel, um, the industry shifted from a VC-based model, which we had over 150 of those in Israel about three years ago, to about 20 that we have now, 20 active, okay? And m most of the funding is, is angeling, and uh, then the few funds, and then the larger funds, international funds. So currently, as, as a starting entrepreneur, I can raise a, a seed round of somewhere between $500,000 to two million in a seed to, to A round, okay? Only right. from angel funding. Yeah. Okay. But uh, as we were mentioning before, if you, if you talk about licensing, everybody runs away, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and music startups are treated like like any other startup. The uh, the potential is look. There's no one who really focuses only on music, but the potential is being looked at. And uh, for really early stage uh, teams, uh, we have tons of accelerators now and incubators. There are almost 35 plus of those in Israel, uh, with with funding, without funding. So there are many opportunities to really start in a, in a structured way yeah. and, and then grow from there. Yeah. You're only, you've been with Soundrop for a few years now. So how have you witnessed you know, your own journey in, into the funding space for a startup that focuses primarily on music? And uh, uh, you know, what are your takeaways uh, from an Oslo perspective, but also from an international one if you have looked around uh, in different parts of the world? Well, I think uh, looking at funding on music startups in, in Norway, it, there's no escaping the truth that we're behind uh, other countries on that. And that has historical reasons. We, we were consumed by oil and gas, and, and that's where a lot of tech money went into. And that's also uh, represent many of the, many of the VCs. It's, it's heavy industry, heavy tech. Uh, whereas uh, you have a few uh, companies that, that care about consumer-facing apps, but more of those uh, VCs are based in, in Stockholm, prominently Helsinki, Copenhagen, uh, which means that uh, you would do well to uh, to get their attention, uh, absolutely. And uh, and it's difficult to get that from Oslo. It's not meaning it's impossible. And there are even examples of startups dealing with licenses. Vidflow is one example of that, uh, which is which is cool. Uh, but as far as us, we, we got our uh, first funding round from North Zone uh, because they knew Spotify and they knew this category. You don't find too many of those VCs that really trust and know and understand the digital music ecosystem because th the knowledge simply hasn't been there for some time. Uh, that's getting better now and I think we see a lot more opportunities, but without a global perspective, it's, it would be very difficult. Yeah, exactly, and I guess like, with Soundrop, you didn't have a licensing component because I guess you, you relied on, on, on Spotify at the beginning and now on different services, but that probably helped in conversations, right? I would imagine, not having to pay licenses directly. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. and I've seen other startups uh, struggle for years trying to secure licenses. And, and I've, I've been on that side of the table from my background at Warner Music, where yeah, I, I just felt sorry for a lot of people that said, I, I think you have a really good idea. I want to give you licenses. This is not going to fly or you'll burn money for two years and nothing's gonna happen. I think that climate is, climate is changing because there are many smart people in the major labels now that understand that we need to provide different tools for these uh, exciting startups. And, and you know, to drive innovation, you cannot try to stifle it with, with uh, impossible license regulations uh, that are even more difficult than what you have in the physical world uh, of the distribution of the music. So, um, I think that's changing. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, quick enough, but I think it's changing. Anybody wants to take a, a, round, or a round funding in, in your particular area? I'll just say quickly that in the Bay Area, we've heard from a lot of music startups, early stage music startups, that they're having a really, really hard time finding funding and that there's too many uh, VCs that have been burned by bad experiences funding music tech, um, a lot related to the difficulties with rights. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, I mean, obviously I think that's too bad because it's really stifling the innovation and, and uh, imagining new models were really stuck in the shadow of the old model still. Um, I think it would be great if there were, uh, you know, if, if uh, music labels were really invested in what's coming next, it, it doesn't really seem like they are. I mean, they're just too big to really move quick enough. Um, and the other thing that we've been hearing is that, 
you know, music wants to be set free from these, you know, these, the, the, just, just the old model that, um, that, that really there's probably more wealth beyond this, you know, immediate legal structure that has been, you know, carried on from the past. So this idea that, um, that we could find totally new model is, is interesting, but it's difficult for music tech right now. Yeah, I was just going to say to offer another perspective. We've we've always been a bootstrapped company. We've never taken on any funding, but um, for us, that's what makes being in a good hub uh, in in a place where you have lots of different people uh, and different technologies and different artists and all that whole ecosystem makes it all the more important. Um, because if we were able to go and concentrate on building a particular product for a couple of years, maybe we could get away with being in a cheaper city in the UK, uh, maybe Manchester or Bristol or those kinds of places. Um, but because we really rely on securing work on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's all the more important for us to be in a place like that. And that's what always attracts us to to be in certain areas is, are we going to find business there? Like, for example, um, our offices is, is actually in a recording studio, not in a tech hub. Um, uh, it's a Metropolis recording studios in West London. And we it's fantastic being there. And there have been other music companies that have moved in now, like Who Sampled are based there. Um, and it's great because we're actually surrounded by potential clients rather than um, competition. Um, so for us, that's been a really interesting way to approach getting new business. Like I could just be working at my desk and artists will just walk past and they'll actually look over my shoulder and it's like, oh, you do iPhone apps. And it's like, I can't say how many projects we've actually got that way. So it's about, you know, when, you, when you're that kind of, serv like we're effectively a service company. Um, and when that's the case, um, basically your placement, your physical placement is so important. Um, and your you know, your drive to get out there and, and find new work. Um, so yeah, that's just like a, maybe a different perspective on the, the funding aspect. Although, as most people probably know, you know, London is, is thriving in that regard as well, but yeah. yeah uh, just for the audience, not, not to get discouraged, uh, the, the models of, of uh, doing things with licensing is, is, is part of a very big industry. Uh, RDO, Spotify, SoundCloud, okay, these are new, new ways to, to do business with distribution, but there's tons of things to do in terms of production of new ways, how to, to how do tools, how do I produce music, how do I write it, okay, how do I enable other people to share it, how do I market it for the bands, and so on and so forth. So I see a lot of startups in these domains, and, and there's a lot of opportunity here, so... So I guess like uh, I should move on to the more controversial part of the panel uh, in a sense. So uh, the question that the, the panel poses is uh, sort of what, what comes of this boom? You know, everybody's talking about uh, music, technology in general, uh, music tech in particular, you know, with this, there's a lot happening in this space. Every music conference has got a tech component now. And, uh, uh, you know, what comes with that? Of course, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of companies work in this space. Uh, we've seen over the years a lot of companies go by the wayside. What comes with the boom? Are there any drawbacks with people really hyping up uh, music tech and going, oh, this is like the next thing, uh, or are there not? And are, are you seeing, for example, it, it is harder, for example, for somebody that is wanted to be in shortage, for, uh, you know, to, to be there because the rents have gone up? And I don't know, a, a, any sort of drawback to the hype around startups in general and perhaps around music startups in particular? Um, well, I mean, yeah, it's no secret. It's expensive. It's an expensive city to live in, London. Um, and it, it still is, and it will be. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, and I think, again, especially if you're, if you're a service company, um, and it's, it, it can be stressful. Um, <laughs> um, so, actually, you know, it's... And I think that's, as, as Tobias said, you know, Berlin had those perfect ingredients that attracted artists and the artists attracted a wider culture and um, and therefore music technology companies like Native and SoundCloud and Ableton are all here. Um, and also, we haven't really spoken about hiring much yet, but attracting talent from Eastern Europe is much easier. And um, so, yeah, it's it's, but I think you can always find ways to make it work, you know, especially if you're if you're starting out um, you can either find funding or you can find related work on the side that will, will see you through certain periods. Um, so, 
that I think with it's a double-edged sword. It's an expensive place to live, but that generally means that people want to be there, and there are lots of people there to talk to. Uh, I can only address the, the only drawback we have in Tel Aviv is at, that we have no market. There are no clients. Eight million people. No, you, you have to travel by plane anywhere. So the next client you, you, could meet, you need to meet is at least two hours plane ride away. And, and that's, but that's also something that, that's why an Israeli startup thinks international from day one. And maybe this is something that, that you guys should also think about it when you start. Okay, Germany is great. It, it's a good market. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't give it up. 80 million people is is important, but also think think about the next step. Meaning, if you write some sort of software, make sure it's it's international from day one, because if you hard coded everything in German in the software, for example you need to, to invest at least 50% extra and actually rebuild your product if you want to add a, an additional language to it. French, for example, English, okay? Sounds banal, but that's, that's something I can, I, I'd like you to think about. It. So, oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what's... Can you best pass it to you? <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I, I I agree to what you say about uh, the licensing uh, debate from from a couple of years ago. It still exists. You know, many VCs have been burned. Absolutely. But I'll choose to be optimistic uh, due to the fact that there are just too many artists and too many consumers with similar problems out there. The online right. movement is. Uh, I mean you will reach people that struggle to f figure out how do I market my music? That's a fairly common Google question. Uh, same with how do I distribute my music? How do I do this? How do I do that? There are, there are too many problems and the, on the, the global community is just too big. Uh, as, as long as you figure that out, you will be fine. But sure, a lot of people have been burned and, and uh, that's gonna stay with the VC community for some yeah. time. And uh, of course, if you look at a market like London, like from a perspective of a, of a city that where perhaps the boom hasn't uh, arrived yet. Uh, you know, it's it's getting there, but it's it's not there yet. So, w what do you think are perhaps the drawbacks that you'd like to avoid from an ecosystem of what's been happening in London? Is there anything? Well, I think in Oslo now we we, we have uh, and in Norway we have a different audience to speak to uh, locally because we have. Uh, the infrastructure now that allows for a lot of uh, inventive solutions and we have a very uh, advanced uh, digital music market so that enables us to do a lot of uh, creative things smartphone penetration broadband connection uh, acceptance to streaming as a format all of these things enable a lot of trust and and I think that that means that you know, the premise is a bit different so uh, yeah. so I don't think there's any there's any drawback to music startups in, in Oslo now right uh, Tobias, you've uh, been here for a long time and sort of seen the evolution of the city and the startup ecosystem as, you know, the startup community has become more established. Uh, have you found there are any drawbacks to it being Berlin, the capital of, you know, Europe for startups, uh, or is it just a positive for now? Well, I can only speak from the perspective of an eye. Yeah. And for us, Berlin is still the only place to be. It's the only city that could arguably be our headquarter. So I think what will be most interesting is how this whole startup, where the startup dynamic will go in the music technology sector, because at the moment there's a boom, so that means diversification, lots of new concepts, new ideas, new companies, and after the boom there's always consolidation. And I, I think the term music tech is already is a bit funny because everything in music is kind of, every instrument is technology, even a guitar is technology. So we are really talking about digital technology and a lot of that technology is recreating aspects of the music creation or music distribution domain in digital that have been analog or physical before. So there's an end to that. And then a lot of it is about coming up with new services music services, digital music services, online services. I think at some point there's also an end to that because then like 
we'll have an assortment of great ideas and then it will consolidate. And then I think it will be about critical mass and then it will be about who has the biggest platform and these platforms will start absorbing all the smaller, I mean, it's already starting. Yeah. And I think it's, it's less, I think Berlin will continue to be a hotbed of innovation. And it's more interesting to see when, especially in the music tech domain, we will really re-enter the phase of consolidation again, where it's about the one platform really becoming the dominant one and then absorbing everything else. Yeah. Anna, uh, from, from your perspective, you're in San Francisco, but you're not in San Francisco in the sense that you're slightly outside the, the sort of main hub. How have you found that, of course, we've uh, probably everybody in the room has read some of the problems that have happened in San Francisco because of how huge tech is and, you know, the income divide between people that work in that sector and people that don't work in that sector, but uh, specifically around music, uh, you know, there's amazing events like SF Music Tech over there, which is uh, uh, sort of uh, collaborating on this panel. And uh, have you found that there are drawbacks to there being so much hype around music and tech? And, and if so, what are they? Uh, yeah, there's, it's interesting. I mean, I consider myself almost basically in, in San Francisco because Oakland and San Francisco are so, are so close um, to each other. But there in San Francisco is a huge backlash against tech and so maybe you guys have seen it. There's like, you know, they're blocking the Google buses that drive people to and from, you know, the offices from San Francisco. And, uh, you know, there's spray paint on the walls, tech scum die. And like very, <laughs> there's like some huge tensions going on, you know. And because people feel like um, the, you know, that the tech companies are not reinvesting in the city. And it's come out in a very strong way in the music community because, um, you know, I mean, and this is a complicated sort of system, but a lot of the tech is just siphoning off the money from music even worse than the labels ever did because they're, you know, the money is going back to the investors. It's not even going back to the musicians. And so, you know, I think that's in the background. And then more immediately, they see all this wealth being created without it being invested into supporting musicians. Musicians can no longer afford to live in the center of the city and they're being, you know, uh, kicked out of the city and needing to live elsewhere when really music um, and culture and art should be embedded in our communities. And so, um, you know, I think there's been a, a big rift that's been created. Um, and I think that the musicians and um, those communities are not feeling the benefits of tech the way that maybe they would have hoped to. Uh, I've seen some statistics and, you know, 68% of music tech investment is going to music services, so that's consumer facing. Um, I think the next one down is 9% uh, with video. Um, and then there's 1% for artist services. Right. So they're not seeing any of the benefits of tech really. And um, so I think that's a huge opportunity space. I hope that we start figuring some of those things out. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 that was fantastic and a great way to sort of end this uh, session in the sense that I wanted to take a couple of questions, if there are any. Uh, there are some, great, in which case you can grab a mic and thank you so much. Uh, there was one, where is she? Okay, then you first come, first serve. <laughs> Uh, hello, Th thank you very much for all the insight. I think it's a really great panel. Um, we're coming from Brussels, uh, here to get inspiration from Berlin, and we hear about all those great places where you have those music and tech ecosystems. Uh, what, would, what would you advise uh, to us to, to foster that energy around tech and music industry in Brussels? Ooh, anybody or any kind that? of city like this one here. Any takers on that one? Oh, well, Jorn, I'll, I'll volunteer you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, I'll, I'll jump on it. Uh, I think yeah. it's all about connecting with the community you have there because of, I don't see Brussels that much as a music center of, of Europe, but of course there are musicians there. There are always people who wonder uh, about how they're going to solve this and that problem that you perhaps have figured out. Uh, connect with that audience and make sure that you validate whatever you do there. Because if it applies to someone in Brussels, it will apply to someone elsewhere as well. So validate whatever it is, whatever that problem you're trying to solve as soon as possible. And that's not going to solve uh, Brussels being a startup hub or a music tech hub or not, but that's going to keep you, 
it's going to let you identify with other companies who try to do the same thing and who try to figure out how to survive in music tech. And then perhaps, you know, the next advice is actually go to Berlin. It's cheap, it's good, it's nice. <laughs> and That's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, host a music hack day. Get in touch with Martin Davis and host a music hack day in Brussels and you'll be inspired. You should have seen that one coming from me. So we do have a second question here. Hi, uh, I'm here with Sound Dudes, a startup that helps uh, sound creators expose their music and grow their fan base. Uh, we developed this with a team of sound creators and techies uh, out of Israel and Berlin. And we already have sound creators on the platform and we've proved that we can grow uh, fan bases for sound creators by five to 10% on a weekly basis. So every week you can keep growing your sound creators, your fans, while you can do your music. And that's what sound creators really want. My question to you is, now that we have uh, our initial sound creators on the platform and we have our statistics, what would be the first next step or the smallest next step that you can help us do uh, in order to get to more sound creators? Because at the moment we're bootstrapping and everything's been, been developed um, from scratch. So sound creators means sound designers or musicians, producers? EDM, IDM. Sorry. Okay. I mean, sound creators are DJs, uh, preferably um, DJs that have a SoundCloud profile, so that that would be their measurement, and we can show them how that grows and uh, how their engagement increases. So anyone who creates music and wants to expose it to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds like a question for a marketing specialist which I'm not really am, but in my experience, among music producers, like the really interesting, valuable tools, everything about that always travels by word of mouth. So I would just think it should go by itself in the first place. Well, I'm in the same category as you are. Soundrop cares about, uh, we create marketing tools for musicians. That's what we try to do. And uh, as far as I could have figured out, do something that someone really loves and that someone thinks is indispensable. It's the perfect tool for them uh, and care about just that because if someone thinks it's, it's the perfect thing, uh, it's probably going to travel and they're going to talk about it. If you make something that tries to do too many things or tries to, you know, that's not going to work. And I'm sure if you spend your money on Google Ads, they're going to disappear before you reach uh, the big Berlin Music Week logo outside here. So. Uh, do something that's indispensable to uh, to your closest community. They will talk about it, and they will be your ambassadors. Anybody else? One more. Great. Hi. Uh, just a quick question. I'm really fond of the concept of uh, Zoo Labs, so I have another question for Anna. Um, maybe yeah, another. Um, there are more questions for the other people. But um, I've been talking about smart money um, early on with a venture capitalist investor. Smart money um, is a term that's being used very often. Uh, since you are not actually paying money to the artist, not physical money, they don't see any changes on the bank accounts, um, the question came to my mind, um, first of all, how are they paying the bills while they're working with you? And uh, second of all, how long do these relationships between you and the artists, or the companies, as you call them, and I really like that, um, how long do these relationships last? So um, how smart, how, how much uh, intelligence you transport there? I like, I like that uh, concept of smart smart money. Do you mean like it makes them smarter? It's a, it's like currency, intelligence currency? Yes. Okay. That's a really cool idea. Um, uh, so we, our, our residencies are two weeks long. So, um, and we're actually experimenting with a 10 day residency in this fall. So it's very quick and short. It's extremely intense. They, you know, have 14 hour days. Um, workshops and then studio time so uh, they 
leave their normal life and come to us. Um, we are developing an alumni program, uh, so we expect them to just be in our community and we do six month follow-ups and year long follow-ups and two year follow-ups. So for us, it's a relationship that we've built um, to keep the discussion going, you know, and um, I think that for us is really important. We've considered the possibility of doing a fellowship because um, obviously the tools that we give them, it's just a very brief introduction and then all of the real work comes in the following, you know, period of time when they're actually having to use it. And it's very interesting because one of the issues we um, ran into was just that, so they learn all this, you know, how, how to talk to each other about strategy and, and that kind of thing. And it's um, hard for them. They're used to meeting with each other to rehearse their, with their instruments, but they're not used to meeting with each other around a table to discuss, you know, strategic goals. Um, and so that, I think we've become sort of the uh, moderator for that discussion with them. And I think it's, it becomes easier and easier as they continue doing it. So I think um, the investment on the long term is really that relationship. Uh, and, it, and it's important. And I think with mentorship in general and probably, I mean, it's the same thing for startups as well. You know, they, you, you really need advisors, whether you're a creative or whether you're a business. Great. Anybody else on that? I think we're okay. And. Uh, we might be able to take one more, if there's one more. Uh, otherwise... Yeah, we don't have that much time for No, we haven't more. got any time No, left. no, no. <laughs> okay, cool. So Great. Well, uh, thank you so much to the panel here. Uh, I think there is a round of applause, if uh, be so kind. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. And, and thank you so much for coming down to the session. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to chat to any of us, I'm sure we'll be available.